service in Kenya. I first saw the rover at the Royal Agricultural Show in Nairobi. And the rover seemed a rather a nice car. The roads were very bad in Kenya. They were earth roads. The conditions demanded a car that was reliable. One didn't want to get stuck out in the bush. Now retired to Leafy Abingdon, the car retains the pedigree of its colonial days. One could sense the quality in the car. It felt solid, as if it had been well engineered. I mean, that's, that's the idea of the gear shift. It was designed in this way so that uh, you could have three persons in the front. The layout of the car was nice. A beautiful toolkit underneath. All the essential sort of spanners and so on that you wanted for the routine maintenance. The comfort and its quietness really impressed us. The only noise was the ticking of the clock. Mind you, we had been running a Ford Prefect before, and the, the change was quite remarkable. Forty-five years on, George still enjoys the distinctiveness of rover engineering, epitomised in long-forgotten devices such as the freewheel system. It was an economy device, really. A uh, car had to be pulling when you change the, the free. So there it is, I'm now in free. And uh, I can change gear anywhere without using the clutch. But of course, the engine has no braking power now. So here we are, we're in free. I'm coming to a, a turn here, but I've got to use the brake in order to slow down. I won't go up to 90 today, it's, uh, it's an old lady now, you know, you've got to treat her rather uh, gently. But in her youth, George's rover took on everything the African climate could throw at her. We had many runs, Mombasa and back, and then by Kilimanjaro. The mud, of course, was always a bit of a problem and stuck once or twice, but they were always willing Africans to lend a push. When we decided to come back from Kenya for good in 1959, I was so attached to the car that uh, we had it shipped back home. This is a jar of Kenya soil, which came out of the cross members of the rover uh, after we'd brought it back. It had got into the cross members as red dust, which I thought was rust, but of course it wasn't rust, it was Kenya soil, Kikuyu red loam. Anyway, there it is, a souvenir of Kenya, which I keep. So, by the late 50s, the P-4 had become known as the Auntie Rover, assuming the character of British civility and refinement. With this image in mind, no one would have guessed that within the heart of Rover, jet experiments lived on. Under the Rover 2000, as it'll be called when the secrecy surrounding its development is over, is a long, low, sleek piece of luxury and precision. It's a zippy light saloon. You know, the go-ahead sort of people for whom this car was tailor-made. Modern-minded people who are used to quality engineering. Discerning people with a bit of dash. Who are really going places. Someone definitely going places was fighter pilot Brian Payne. When he took a ground commission in the mid-60s, he was forced to get his thrills a little closer to Earth. Flying was great fun, 
I'd rather have kept doing it. But my other interest always had been motor cars. The Rover 2000 was something of a revelation. It was, to my mind, far ahead of its time. Since buying his first 2000 in 1968, Brian has rarely been without a P6. His 3.5-litre V8 is considered the ultimate, but even the modestly powered 2-litre version was enough to hook the young flight lieutenant. Quite frankly, I wanted an exciting car, and there weren't very many exciting cars around. I remember it created an enormous stir at the time, because until then, Rovers um, had produced fairly staid, um, very dignified, high-quality motor cars. And the 2000 was totally out of character. It was more of a high-performance sporting saloon. To me, it was a disaster when the 70-mile-an-hour speed limit arrived. Um, until then, um, I literally used 100 as a cruising speed. I can still remember a phrase at the beginning of the handbook. It said, when driving continuously at speeds above 105 miles an hour, inflate the tyres to um, 36 pounds per square inch all round. And that was in a car with a top speed of perhaps 108. So in short, they fully expected you to use its performance. As a small company, Rover could ill afford failure. But in people like Brian, there was a ready-made market. The car was an instant success, winning rave reviews and the very first Car of the Year award. It was originally planned for building 350 a week, I think. Yes. And I think that throughout most of its life, which was total 13 years or something like that, the build was over 700. And occasionally hit 1,000 a week. I didn't know we'd succeeded in P6 until we found we had a huge loyalty of customers who bought customers, the first one yeah. and came back and bought another one. I knew we won them. The P6 was Rover's most successful car ever, but it also marked the end of an era. In 1967, the British Leyland Corporation moved in, and in the process, a legacy of distinctive British engineering was lost forever. <laughs> 